Well, it's with great pleasure that uh, I'm able to uh, introduce Kiwi Sotoma uh, to the AA, or rather back to the AA. Because as most people know, uh, or several people will know, uh, Kiwi is a rather frequent visitor to this group. Um, this occasion is probably the most uh, high profile and most formal in uh, the recent past. Uh, I met Kiwi last year when he ran a workshop long workshop, and it was 18 months ago, but when we have our final jury for those projects next week, uh, you'll still, I think, one who will still detect the influence and repercussions of that workshop in many of the projects. Uh, he's just finished, or is finishing, a workshop with the Emerging Technologies Studio, uh, and I'm sure that workshop will have an equally uh, influential effect on that. Kibi mentioned to me yesterday that uh, in a way these trips to the AA are a uh, working vacation. And as much as I like to think of the AA as a leisure resort, uh, I think that's more of a comment about how busy he is than uh, anything else. When he's not here, which is most of the time, he is in Helsinki as a founding member of Ocean North. Uh, together with Michael Hensel um, and the rest of the This design collaborative represents to me one a uh, clear example of a set of emerging young practices, though getting not so young and not so emerging anymore, but quite well established. Uh, I'm feeling my age. Um, anyway, but I think the sort of emergence of a new type of uh, design collaborative, which represents a new way of practicing, um, which is quite exciting, uh, in which Every project is treated not simply as a design project, but as an opportunity for research. In the coming weeks, Kiwi will be traveling to the US to talk about one of the projects that you've seen already here, the exoterrain, which is in a way an icon of contemporary design discourse's fascination with the surface. Recently, Ocean North have completed a competition for a replacement for the World Trade Center, uh, also completing a virtual gallery space. Uh, we'll see much of this work tonight um, and also other things to come. Uh, now the range and scope of the work is quite vast and perhaps that one is tempted to explain this through a biography. Uh, Kiwi studied originally at the University of Technology's Department of Furniture and Spatial Design uh, and later in, art, in architecture at the University of Art and Design. Uh, the names of these schools perhaps best capture the sort of institutionalization and disciplinary boundaries that have been drawn around the prospective uh, design fields. Uh, boundaries that it seems is one of Ocean's primary tasks to traverse. And in the, in the age of globalization and telepresence, I think it's worth recalling for a moment uh, the location of Ocean North in Helsinki in Finland. Um, we're perhaps all familiar with the tradition of modernism and modern design in that area. And in a way, it's important that Ocean North, which is with its overarching focus on urbanism in all scales and all modes of design, are located there. Uh, for example, recently, they designed a major exhibit in the Chiasma building for one of the largest shows in Finland. Now, the Chiasma building designed by Stephen Hole is a, presents a rather different sensibility towards space, form, and program than the notions. Now, Ocean's design manages with, I have to say, sort of slightly surprising light-handedness and subtleness to transform the space, uh, not by respecting it or by deferring to it or by seeking to undermine it, but simply to engage and transform its sensibility. Um, this approach seems exemplary of their desire to affect change in the culture of design, not through an avant-gardism or a false critical practice or an oppositional strategy, but through tactile and thoughtful engagement with the contemporary forces that traverse the city. So it's with a sense of anticipation in the development of the work, looking a little bit to the recent past and hopefully a little bit towards the recent future that I welcome Kiwi to the stand.
notes. Wine. <laughs> yes. I mean, I've been here once before. It was 1997. And uh, I was 26 years old, overseeing the construction of so far the biggest project that I've been involved in, which is an exhibition architecture of the Barbican. Uh, Michael Hensel was very kind to organize the lecture. I came over and left the slides to the Barbican building. And I think there were you know, one and a half or two, twice this amount of people waiting. And eventually I showed up with my slides, having picked them up again from the Barbican, I think. 20 minutes late. So <clears throat> this time we're off to a better start. That time I showed some projects, and some of those projects I'll show again, and uh, somehow to make a link to the past. And some of you might have seen that lecture. You'll be able to perhaps look at and see how the work has evolved over the last, uh, how many, five years it is. Now, um, Today, I don't want to, since I'm not a brilliant theoretician, I don't want to discuss theory, but I, I will go shortly through some of the kind of central themes uh, that are there for me in, 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 uh, in our work. And uh, I think all those themes somehow come together in this one project, which I consider my first project. Uh, it was done in 1995, first exhibited at the Architectural Association in 1996. I think, I don't know who said it, uh, somebody said that you only have one good idea in your, in your life, and I don't know if the idea is so good. I'm really a bit afraid that <coughs> it might not be, but this is it, I mean, for me. Uh, this project is entitled The Extra Terrain, and uh, it was a very, very simple, um, Project. At the time, we started to, um, we somehow, we recognized that uh, people never, let me take that back. I think uh, I uh, that I developed a kind of definite dislike of most designed environments, uh, a lot of the architecture, because it seemed to me to, to prescribe a kind of uh, a set of instructions, instructions for use, a set of values, and didn't allow me as a person to take a kind of active role in defining how I would like to use that environment. I think, I mean, that's a very underlying kind of personal motivation. So we started, we decided to create a project where we could test whether it would be possible to create an object that allows the user to take an active role, that kind of transforms the relationship that so between the subject and things, which is so often fixed, into some sort of a terrain of exchange. Uh, so we came up with an idea of designing a piece of what is essentially furniture. Uh, and the idea was to do it in such a way that formally, the piece of furniture, the, the object has affordances for different kinds of use. Uh, the geometry bears a relationship to the human body. Uh, and you know that relationship, of course, depends on who you are, whether you're a child or you're grown up, uh, and also what the social context is. Is this object placed in a bar, in a private space, in our studio, in an exhibition at Kiasma, as it is here? And the only the object is intentionally designed in such a way that it bears absolutely no kind of it has no typological signs. There, it had the formal language doesn't re reveal what it is supposed to be. It doesn't give you any instructions for use. The only way to figure out what it can do is to engage with the object and kind of learn the way a child learns when he engages with the environment. I mean, to me, uh, <coughs> and children are always, when, when this project is exhibited somewhere, children are the ones who, without hesitation, engage and experiment because And not a psychoanalyst, but I think they haven't developed yet a uh, kind of strict categories. 
Uh, so they, had, they don't have any trouble, kind of, they don't have to stand there and question, you know, what is this object, how should I relate to it? They simply will go and explore its potential by, you know, sitting on it, trying it, crawling over it, under it, and so on. In the 60s, there were many projects, and there's, in the 60s I find, when I look for references for our work, in the 50s and 60s, I find most of them. Uh, in the 60s, there were many projects by Werner Panto and others that where furniture was designed as landscape, but there was a, there's one particular difference between this project and those projects. Those projects were all soft. This is not. It was intentionally designed in such a way that it has hard angle, hard edges. It's a combination of kind of curvy and edgy geometries. And it looks, when you look at it, it looks even hostile. It's, uh, it was designed partly using some of the geometry from the stealth bomber, intentionally. And, but because it's slippery, it doesn't, you, you don't hurt yourself. But the difference is that the object requires you to adapt to a degree that furniture usually never ever does. And I think that's somehow the, one of the kind of fundamental traits that, that is present in all the work that what we're attempting to do, and one of the things that we're attempting to do, is to come up with architectures, objects, and solutions that have a very, very active role in the exchange between kind of subjects and things, in the exchange between people and the architecture. I mean, I think, personally, <coughs> I'm almost uh, opposed to the kind of um, design approaches where uh, design becomes an attempt to too far adjust and comfort the user. What I find more interesting is, is when it's possible for you, you as a user, if it's possible for people to go and engage and explore the environment and through that interaction with the environment discover possibilities. To allow, let's say, function emerge just as much as a possibility to, to, of, of form as to prescribe it through some other means. Some images of the, how the object was made. This very simple process of taking an ABS sheet of plastic and vacuum form it in a mold and spraying it with a pad on the backside with high density polyurethane so that areas that require structural strength uh, are thicker and areas which are supposed to be flexible are left thinner. And then it's painted, in this case, in black. <laughs> <laughs> I think 97, I apologize for that image. I won't do that again. <laughs> uh, but, um, so I think what's, no, I mean, I try to take, there's a few general points that there are there on, uh, in all the work, and I try to identify that, or points that are very important to me, but of course to, the, to my uh, partners as well. Uh, uh, I think in general there's an attempt to incorporate the unpredictable. I mean, the fact that you, it's impossible to predict how, a, you know, what the definition of an object once you place it out in the world. You cannot predict too far, you know, what the program of a building is over five years. You cannot predict too far how pe a person in interprets a piece of artwork and, and so on. So what we try to do is to take that very seriously, take that into account and incorporate the unpredictable in the form of the object, for example, as in the case of the extra terrain. Uh, you could see, you could imagine that there are a lot of different scenarios of use for incorporating that one single uh, coherent object. Uh, then, a sub, then a second uh, kind of characteristic is there that all the projects are what I would say call enabling. That, and, um, you know, a good example is that instead of the one way of creating an environment, people argue, is to of, of that provides for freedom and, and provides for the end user or the user to uh, engage is to, to do, I mean, take the open plan approach, as it were. Have a space in which, quote unquote, everything is possible. You can move the walls and so on. And 
to me, I mean, this is what I would refer to some, to some degree as a kind of negative. In some cases, it's a valid strategy, but to me, it also provides something that, is, that I would call a negative freedom. The architecture doesn't really propose or enable anything. What's, what's common to all our projects that they're highly specific. I mean, materially, formally, in every sense, they're very specific. But while they're specific, they're also decoded. And that's why uh, the, the title of the lecture uh, don't know if it's exactly a misuse of the term, but by the decoded, I mean that they are they are designed in such a way that they bear they don't bear in any instructions for use for specific use, but they try to allow the user to take an active role in kind of in defining that use, much exactly like the ex with the extra train piece, um, and the use of these uh, this um, these objects or environment you know, to a large degree, then emerges real time. And, you know, this is a strategy by, that, that allows to create architecture that you can agree is, in a, in a, in a sense, adjustable, that it, it adjusts to the future. While it doesn't really change, there are no movable parts or of any, any kind, for example. So this is another, in 1997, designed in Helsinki, a proposal for a football stadium, which is a kind of, an attempt to see what you could do with the same strategy in a larger scale. Here what we proposed was a stadium building, which is an, ex there's a park landscape here to the right, and the city is here on the left. What we proposed is a, is a stadium as an extension of that park landscape, simply. And programmatically, it would, you know, cater for more activities than just the football stadium. It consists of three lasagna-like layers. The bottom layer is, is, is you know, floats <coughs> above ground so that you can, connect the ground level, uh, uh, the four fields around the uh, building for larger events. And it's kind of slightly undulating and would have been, the idea was to embed it with some technologies that then enable for different kinds of uh, activities to take place, in addition to those that are programmed. Then the second layer is an, uh, also topographic result in a kind of seating organization which is clustered, which is much like this. This is a photograph exactly from that building site at the turn of the century. And the third layer was a kind of large oversight cloud-like roof that covers areas also around the building in order to provide for, for example, cover for seating here uh, for viewing the matches in the uh, practice field. I mean, this project is a funny... <laughs> Uh, this project, when we proposed it, um, it was almost, I think, thrown out of the competition. And the, the, only, the only comment we got back was that a football stadium, an organic storm is not appropriate to be a football stadium. And I told this to Cynthia Davidson, who, very, uh, and, uh, who replied that what is football if not an organic storm? I was very proud of this response. So <coughs> very quickly, a few other projects where then kind of that simply that we've done uh, we've done a number of, of, of smaller scale temporary installations exhibitions one to fund the office but also to ex uh, explore how through the use of materials it's possible to incorporate the, let's say the unpredictable the dynamic elements that you have in a, in a, in a project I mean a very simple project like this a, a, a furniture competition, kind of exhibition pavilion. Here, simply, and in a previous case, which is a stage design project here, th through simply kind of use of, of some of the lighting interactive materials and through the configuration of those lights and the, peop the, the way people would kind of move through this space, uh, the attempt was to create kind of an incredible, you know, a great array of, of ambient effects that, you know, change over time, you know, depending on, on the changing of the overlight, overall lighting situation, how people are in the space, and, and what, the, uh, what the exhibition lights are programmed to do. Oops, this is an auto run. Then uh, another small project when, where that simply explores, let's say, a similar formal language oops, as the, uh, as the uh, Töller Stadium. Here, uh, 
this is a commission by the Kiasma Museum of Contemporary Art for an uh, art installation and exhibition. Uh, what we sim simply try to do is to develop a form, uh, basically take it to Cartesian gallery. We were given one wall, all the other artists hung uh, work in frames or objects. What we did is we took the entire wall and deformed it. And the only aim was to try to see what happens if you create, take that kind of Cartesian geometry and you deform it and you create a geometry that is so vague that the way you perceive it depends kind of entirely on you know, the lighting situation, but also in, in, you know, from your position relative to the, you know, relative to the object. Uh, and it was, it was very simply realized by, um, you, know, you saw the process, by creating a computer model and modeling it by hand, and then by, with CNC creating elements, uh, styrofoam elements that are embedded in the wall. Nobody in the I mean, most people came to the gallery and would look at the exhibition and then find a good spot on the wall and lean on it or, you know, take. So, and they would figure out that it's artwork by the time they saw, saw the label on the wall. <laughs> but it would cause a lot of <laughs> damage. But, and also, it happened that <laughs> the, same, the same exact day, there were news in Finland that the Kiasma building is leaking. And of course, the joke was the, the exactly in the exhibition that this is the you know the entire project is caused by that leak. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, and <coughs> another very small case project. New York Times invited us to design a Millennium capsule. So the readers of the New York Times would select objects uh, to be embedded in a capsule for a thousand years. So uh, here we didn't know actually what, what the objects were and what they were going to be, nor of course is it, is it possible to do, you know, predict the future over a thousand years. Uh, what we proposed was a series of nine capsules to be dropped on the rim of the Antarctic ice so that eventually they would melt and start floating around the oceans. And then as a design strategy, we proposed to kind of use the capacity of, of con contemporary kind of modeling software to, to um, model the capsule exactly around those objects that would be selected. So each capsule would have two voids, and these represent the voids, they simulate basically, that would be modeled around the selection of the objects. Those two voids would then be embedded in a composite ceramic shell, which was that the digital model, and this is a plaster model uh, made by hand. And that composite ceramic shell would be embedded in a titanium shell. And the titanium, the form of the titanium shell is then, I mean, it's informed by two things. It's informed by the inner geometry of the ceramic object and the kind of outer forces of the, that, of the aquatic conditions, the kind of requirements that come from the fact that this, the object has to float and perform in a certain way in water. So it was a kind of an interesting object. Uh, project because you could see how the whole, whole project becomes an articulation of, let's say, the inner forces, the kind of inner brief of the project, and the outer forces, and the negotiation of, of those. And I, that idea t was taken further in a, com in a completely other scale in the project that uh, was yesterday, I think, opened at the Max Protest Gallery in New York. A proposal, where I think they've invited 30, 40 international architects to propose uh, designs for the new World Trade Center, visions, I think one few images and or so. I mean here the the project project proposes two volumes the size of the well the previous World Trade Centers, two empty volumes, atrium spaces, uh, in left inside uh, a new building, as it were as as traces of the uh, of the new building. And a kind of two kind of draping skins that wrap around those volumes. The entire kind of the resultant space of the uh, the building becomes uh, it's, it's not specifically programmed, uh, and it becomes kind of articulate, kind of highly articulated by this warping and and and, and uh, interlocking skins. And furthermore, here in this project, this the uh, one of the central ideas was to use the 
kind of the skin for circulation and for all sorts of technical, for kind of running all the technical equipment. Basically, it's to leave the entire uh, kind of the depth of the building open. To use the fact kind of the kind of surface articulation uh, in order to provide for the, for the in order to incorporate the, all the technical components of the project. And this basically shows the circulation diagram. And there's, a, there's another theme, there's a theme that uh, emerges here, or uh, actually doesn't has emerged earlier, but is represented here since these are not chron chronologically organized, which has to do with redundancy. I mean, here clearly, uh, this kind of a circulation diagram is re redundant, there's too much circulation. But that's a kind of a, a, another strategy, another way of dealing with the, with the un, unexpected with the, the, uh, or incorporating it. If, for example, in an urban plan, for example, in an urban plan, which I'm not going to show for, for the city of Narva, we propose the highly uh, kind of, kind of you know, I mean, complex circulation system, system precisely for the reason that uh, if, you know, one, one of the roads doesn't work, then there's another one that becomes activated. And the same uh, principle operates here. I mean, practically, but then also uh, architecturally. You can go from A to B you know, through more than just one route. So it becomes an architectural quality. This is here. <coughs> then back in, back in time, 97, this was a proposal for an embassy building. We proposed that an embassy should not be an icon or a monument, but we, it's simply a, a, a landscape for exchange. And we tried to realize the same by creating a building that simply becomes an, an intensification of the landscape. And the idea was to, to achieve this by articulating the landscape, uh, which would be here, sculpture garden, pool, in a similar manner as that which makes the building uh, zone. And then pulling out and pushing in, and pulling out materials from the building into the landscape, onto the landscape, and pulling in materials from the landscape into the building. So that the boundary, the relationship between the figure and ground becomes completely diffused. And the building then would open up to the landscape on a number of levels, would have an inner courtyard. This shows somehow, you can see quite here, how the, the materials are basically distributed over the skin, kind of following the logic of a camouflage. Uh, this was the project that I was, that I was working on last, but last time I was here. Uh, the exhibition architecture for a, uh, one of the largest Finnish festivals of uh, festivals of Finnish culture that had you know, all sorts of activities from textile exhibitions to jewelry to tango to this and that, and we had to come up with a with an architectural solution that would kind of make bind all those projects into coherent entity, you know, without actually physically being continuous, and provide a kind of landscape and a kind of different kinds of situations between that for, for the different kinds of needs. So what we proposed was, a, as it were, a kind of folded landscape, uh, an archipelago of surfaces on which, under which, attached to which all the events would take place. And these are a few images. This is an image, for example, from the Concourse Gallery where an exhibition of Finnish textile design took place. These were all structured, simply realized using uh, steel profiles and suspended uh, mesh. There's another, <coughs> I've organized slightly this project like this because there's, as it were, there's two, uh, on a very superficial level, there's also two themes that run through the world. One at work, one is the use of surface, the other one has to do with the use of a kind of wireframe like structures. Uh, the Barbican was one of the first projects that explain, e explores the, the potential of the wireframe. And this was another one in a larger scale. It's an entry for a competition for a, for a uh, music and concert hall where we proposed a building that the concert hall is floated here in a corner to complete the urban block. And then uh, the, the city is pulled in the building as a kind of continuous, slightly Kind of folding, undulating landscape, 
uh, and then the activities all, again from the park here facing the Al Alvaraldo building uh, across the street from this one are pulled also pulled in the building and the activities that of, of the cultural center would be kind of vice versa pushed out into the park and the surface then is taken up as a ramp in the middle of the building between the concert hall and the office spaces there and the entire space in between the structure would be kind of a wireframe as it were a forest structure that that while it's also structure it becomes a way of kind of way of articulating uh, the space So here, that idea of, of, uh, was, I think, taken further, explored. This was 1998, an, ex an installation at the RUM Gallery in Oslo, where we simply, we, we had, I think, something like 600 meters of, of steel tube and rod that we used to, within this more or less Cartesian space, with a kind of tilted roof, we used to <coughs> weave another set of spaces. I mean, the idea was that at, uh, when you have uh, what we recognize actually this I think one of one of the occasions when they discussed discussed this was when we had one of the prototypes from the Barbican project at the studio and w without any skin on it and we realized that when you, once you have one or more linear elements that line up what, you, what, what happens is you start to read and perceive a surface. And it, it's a very powerful means, and a kind of minimal means, of creating a sense of, kind of spatial division, a boundary condition. So here, we kind of, it was an experiment, we pushed that idea to the extreme. See what happens if you kind of use these linear elements to weave a space. And to a large degree, your experience of that space, the interesting thing is that it becomes emergent. The way you, what the surfaces that you perceive depend on where you uh, stand. Then furthermore, there were, in the gallery, there were three lights that were hooked to motion detectors, and then there was uh, a kind of movement activated uh, soundscape. So it's one of the first exp examples where we try to, when I said, in talk, I think I said it, I hope, that where we try to instrumentalize the unpredictable to take those components that are dynamic and you know, not try to get rid of them, but really make use them as the material in the project in order to, as, as the material in the project that generates the effects of the project. So here, <laughs> here, the, uh, <laughs> the project, uh, I mean, the emergence, the spatial experience of the project of, depends on the, of the lighting configuration and the, your position, you know, relative to the light and the structure. And what's interesting is the entire, the, the nature of the space changes from one moment, moment to another dramatically. And I suppose I, what I should have is a video here to prove, it, prove you, but I, all I have is some images. Then you see the same, uh, this was a project for, uh, um, commissioned by, what is it, the NRW Forum. It basically, they, they organized the Living Bridges exhibition to go to uh, uh, Dusseldorf. And they commissioned N uh, MVRDV and us and a few local offices to design a living bridge for, for the city of Dusseldorf. Uh, I won't go too much into the urban scheme, but what we proposed was basically a bridge that kind of strategically located in, in, rel in, in relation to kind of adjacent urban programs to catalyze those programs and kind of short circuit and connect them. What we looked at was a number of kind of urban networks and how the bridge could become kind of urban catalyst and an intensifier. Then in terms of, both in terms of, sorry, in terms of structure and program, the entire bridge was conceived as a bundle the idea was to create a st uh, structure that is, let's say, highly redundant. It's a mixture between kind of arches and beams, and uh, 
the performance which uh, it's difficult to predict, actually, but potentially it could have a, a, a superior performance. Uh, and th the same strategy was uh, adapted for the program, so that the, the program was kind of divided into strips that were kind of woven together. And it's the interrelationship between these strips uh, that starts to then generate and provide the kind of ground for, uh, for, uh, for kind of emergent activities, emergent programs. Simply what it proposed was that car traffic is diverted away from the kind of the way straight across the bridge uh, onto this kind of outer ring. Then there's all the pedestrian traffic and, and uh, transport is directed straight across the bridge. And then there's an inner ring right here that houses kind of programs, shops, and so forth that service both, service both of the, uh, the other there's a little animation here. Then there's two projects <coughs> that I want to talk more about and conclude with. Uh, both were realized last, the other one two years ago. It's completely wrong, not 2002, but 2000. Uh, and the other one was done this year, and, and Chris Hyde referred to that project, which was the exhibition architecture for design for um, the building of Kiasma. Uh, so the other one, the project two years ago, is located here. And uh, the project that we just completed, which is going to be taken down actually tomorrow, is located right there in, at the Kiasma building. This here is uh, our two old warehouses that are under threat to be demolished. They, right now they house most of the kind of uh, underground cultural activity in Helsinki. And this here is the Parliament House, one of the most prominent and kind of formal buildings uh, in Helsinki. What we proposed, we were invited to create a project that represents represent Helsinki in the Art Zenda kind of Baltic area Art Biennale. What we was pr proposed is a project that kind of connects these two very different kinds of urban spaces. Uh, it was uh, entitled Intensities. The idea was to kind of intensify the urban space through the mere use of uh, means of architecture and through the other means of the kind of other art forms that were involved in the project. We worked together with 16 artists. I was a graphic designer, uh, painter, uh, new media artists, dancers, and so on. I usually forget some. And <coughs> the idea was basically to, and we did the architectural part. What we wanted, what we proposed to create was to a project that is very kind of bears a great relationship to the extra train or, for example, the landscaper. Uh, the project, uh, a few aims. The, the project uh, should perceptionally wanted it to perceptionally create a, a connection between these two very different urban spaces. Right now, they're kind of separated by a series of walls and layers. I mean, they're actually on different levels. Then, in addition to that, we wanted to provide for physical access on the site. There's a bridge structure. And then on the courtyard of these, uh, these two warehouses, there are two structures that create the kind of amphitheater-like social space. And there's a thick structure which is not visible, which is inside the other one of the, the other uh, warehouse. Now, those were the kind of basic uh, practical requirements. Uh, but the, the overall idea was to create, to see what happens <laughs> if you create an uh, architecture or create a structure that really lends itself between the kind of categories. It's uh, of uh, you know, 
by which people basically assess the environment. This was designed in such a way, and there were no media kind of warnings or anything, it was designed in such a way that it's impossible for people to tell whether it's art, you know, whether it's an artistic project, because it's not like the previous project housed within a concept, concept where the context kind of explains <coughs> the piece. It simply emerged there over a few weeks, one day, uh, one day in the spring. Uh, so it was a kind of project that somewhere landed itself somewhere between an constru ongoing construction site and the kind of aesthetics of that, uh, you know, sculptural work, and then, you know, a fully functional kind of architectural uh, design. There's a bridge and then these two platforms that were intended for to cater certain activities. And together with the artist, we worked to create a kind of program over one month that would, s would utilize and engage the installation, the landscape of the installation in different ways and suggest people different ways of engaging. And after that, they would leave the project and where the project would be left there for another four months. And things were, would be literally allowed to emerge. And uh, Over here, for example, I mean, rock concerts, fashion shows, uh, skateboarders, um, rollerbladers, bikers, nightclubbers, you know, all sorts of different events took place over the period that the structure was left there. And here, I mean, again, that we tried, we used the kind of the, the wireframe. This was cons also constructed using steel profile, timber planks and uh, some synthetic uh, net over which the work of the graphic designer was printed. Kind of the minimum means of creating what we imagine would be an, kind of a new kind of art institution almost, an open air structure that engages those people that are just passing, <coughs> that contains some programmed uh, activities, but then also provides and, and provokes people who come to the area uh, to come up with new ones. And uh, oh, it really worked, uh, I have to say. The, and it was, I think, one of the most the scariest projects that I've been ever involved in, because it's uh, what when discovered from this, uh, what we discovered, at least I discovered from the experiment, was that. Uh, <coughs> When people encounter this kind of environment, the, that encounter is not always exactly positive. Children, uh, people have nothing to do with architecture. I mean, they, I'm overgeneralizing. Uh, readily engage and think, you know, you get. I was, I got usually the best research I do when I was stand, uh, I was standing there finishing this, helping them, like, you know, one day before the opening, helping them to paint the last structure there, uh, with my kind of working gear on, and, uh, and I would hear the comments of people passing. And they would range from, uh, you know, great, fantastic, what is this? It must be something new. This must be the, you know, the latest thing in arts, or, or children just going, yoo and climbing. And, and then, and this is maybe over generalizing, usually what I imagine uh, middle-aged men with technical education walking by and being really, really upset really and the best one and maybe I'm not politically incorrect maybe the best one was uh, that I remember was a man coming behind me and he stopped there and he looked at it and then you know I think he said something like what the hell must have been a woman architect poor engine poor engineers you know all sorts of things they spend money to yeah. You know, something like this. And we went on the conversation, of course. I encouraged him. He didn't realize that I had anything to do with it. <laughs> and uh, anyway, the, but to say, I mean, this, this project, maybe I would have, one thing I would have liked to tell him that the project was entirely we, and this is maybe one thing that's pe peculiar to Ocean North. Uh, these projects, are s the funding itself, initiated, raised. The Cultural Capital Foundation of Finland provided for 15 to 20 percent funding and I provided the rest by calling uh, the Finnish Steel and uh, the Finnish Timber Company and all the materials were sponsored 
and 50% uh, of the construction was sponsored. And, uh, you know, I think the last three days of construction was sponsored by friends who came with fr engineer, friend, engineer friends with PhD who came on the site to help out to finish the project. So here are some images of the finished project. This shows the, the first structure which basically connects uh, the main street of Helsinki to the lower, to the other side of the, the pedestrian bypass. Sorry. And this shows, this is an example, uh, some photographs I took from a dance performance in action where the dancers created a choreography that goes from the, kind of the side of the city, this structure, over this bridge, all the way into one of the warehouses where there was a club. And here you see how people start to appropriate the surface of the quote-unquote bridge just because it's inclined. I mean, it functionally doesn't even make any sense to make, create an, a bridge that has an inclination like that. But the fact that the geometry, uh, you know, kind of, it's the geometry enables for this. And here you see the dancers, how they basically pull the entire, every time they would perform, they would pull an entire crowd from the streets that who just happened to pass by over into the kind of more <coughs> private area of the courtyard over this bridge structure. over here into the courtyard. Here's, this is an example of one of the events. I think we were so beat after the project that we were very bad in documenting what happened on the site. I think we took, just took a vacation, but, but this is one of the events. It's a rock concert that took, took place on the site. Uh, and it was not planned at all. Somebody just called us and suddenly said, well, do you know, can we use it? And we said, of course you can use it. And they set up the band on the other side and then the audience sat on the other side and with the band over there. Then the final exhibition, this diagram is a ripoff from an old A, I think the AA Files publication on Yokohama that Jeff Kipnis used. He's also using the same diagram, I think, for the Mood River exhibition that's upcoming at the Wexner Center where the Exotrain project is exhibited in three weeks. Here, this was used as a kind of diagram to explain our project for the ARS-01. ARS-01 is a, uh, every five years in Finland, there's a, <coughs> the biggest exhibition of contemporary art, I think, in, Scan in Scandinavia. This time, 70 or so artists invited to exhibit their work, one or more pieces per artist. And all, for the first time, all this would take place in the building of Kiosma. Now, of course, it's a great challenge how to deal with a, a chiasma that has a very, very you know, strong architectural language. How to come up with an architect, how to kind of provide for the you know, conflicting needs that are there for the, I mean, the artwork has media specific needs. Some bears daylight, some doesn't, some needs dark, some is loud, and so on. And every artist wants their own white box. And, uh, <coughs> uh, and then the third thing, uh, to provide for is some sort of a kind of content specific organization of the work, something that the curators wanted to realize. You know, these works should be together and so on. So all these conflicting basically all these conflicting uh, interests were supposed to be satisfied. So what we did is basically most of the work was a simply an exercise of very primitive diagramming of, of huge maps and, and stickers and different kind of categories and shifting the work around. But architecture what, we, architecture, what we proposed them was an uh, architecture that would not operate like collage. Usually ar exhibition architecture operates like collage. It has a hierarchical relationship to the building. You, know, you have the architecture and then, then you have the, ex the existing building architecture, then you have the exhibition architecture, which is clearly separate and kind of subordinate to the other architecture. And a lot of cases, if, if this is somehow, for example, geometrically articulated or designed, the exhibition architecture itself becomes the celebrated object. And of course, this is what artists uh, kind of protest. So what we proposed is to simply peel off, kind of warp, extend buildings at the existing, the, the scale of the existing buildings in order to create an architecture that does not radically stand out, 
but r radically reorganize the spaces of chiasma to provide kind of spaces for each individual work. Almost each individual work had its, a sense of its own space. So we used the kind of these surfaces to kind of break up spaces, but also at the same time create, we <coughs> took what Stephen Hall had an idea of a one singular flow throughout the space, which actually does not work, because there's a one particular problem that has to do with the ramp area in the third floor. Uh, that it's designed in such a counterintuitive way that people do not, they, they do not discover their way up, they miss the entire fourth floor. This was one of the central things, one of the things to be fixed. But <coughs> overall, what we proposed is to, you know, take this idea of a singular flow, but create kind of, create another architecture that makes that flow much, much more turbulent, much like that diagram. So that, for example, here, where you have three Cartesian box spaces with diagonally kind of openings that diagonally connect them. Uh, <coughs> I mean, his idea of a flow is, you know, the, you know it's, it's the idea of these three, three spaces. What we did is basically extended that surface and ran, you know, surfaces across the spaces from one space to another. In order to break up the space, you, know, you have art space, you provide space for artwork on both sides, and you also diffuse the experience of boundary between these spaces. Actually, this becomes red at one space. So what happens is that the, when one travels through the exhibition, the, it becomes, the experience of the exhibition is much less, uh, the experience of kind of spatial boundaries is much less definite. Artworks are seen, they have their own sense of space, but they're, they're kind of experienced in different kinds of adjacencies to one another. It's difficult to explain. And <coughs> point of the somehow the choreography of the the idea choreographically for the exhibition is that because there is no hierarchical relationship between the new structure and the uh, the old structure what we can uh, <coughs> what we could do is to to uh, subtly vary the relationship between the building <coughs> and the new architecture so that sometimes <coughs> what you have is an intervention that just retreats in the walls or it's impossible if you're not from don't know the building intimately to know whether it's new or not. But then it's at the other extreme, the exhibition actor takes on a very strong role. So it kind of affiliates with the building. And what that provides for is a kind of experience of very rich kind of spatial experience uh, once you move out through the spaces. Because the, these, the elements, the artworks, the architecture, and the existing architecture, the new architecture kind of constantly reconfigure. And that makes for the kind of complexity and, and, and creates the dramatism, dra dramatism <coughs> of the experience of viewing the exhibition. These are some computer diagrams. <coughs> and in order here to basically involve everybody in the working process, the multitude of, 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 of curators and technical staff, <coughs> we built one to 25 models of the entire building of Kiasma. <coughs> and here you see the for example, the second floor gallery that I was referring to, where we built floor-to-ceiling walls that solve all the acoustic and you know lighting problems related to video work, provide for more spaces, <coughs> and at the same time interconnect these spaces. They're simply built. It's simply wood and aluminium scaffolding with veneer, recyclable foam, and theater fabric here suspended on it. <coughs> Here you see how on the third floor, we run basically one long surface around all these spaces. Here it's floor to ceiling. Here it's suspended off the floor and ceiling. Here <coughs> the surface basically creates, encloses these spaces that are usually open uh, to create spaces for video works. On the other, other side, it simply creates a sense of flow from between these two spaces and provides a backdrop for Anita Dube, who's an Indian uh, mosaic artist and her work. <coughs> So these are some images from the construction. <coughs> these are some very amateur video that I took the day before I came <coughs> from the site. But this shows one of the artists and how she used basically the built exhibition architecture. With some artists, we worked uh, all the way from the beginning. We knew what they were more or less going to do and we collaborated with them. And for other art, <coughs> for other artworks, uh, we were able to just provide, you know, be more flexible with them. But there are sort of certain key 
works around which the whole exhibition was uh, anchored. Here on the other side, you see the kind of the long floor to ceiling wall that creates these video spaces, and the passing from between that from that space to the light gallery is simply created by warping the surface, creating a kind of parabolo paraboloid surface. <coughs> Provides for opening. And here, <coughs> in that same floor, two surfaces are, are created in order to organize the circulation and try to fix the circulation in chiasma. Usually, you do not, it's very common to intuitive, intuitive to walk up from where you came from and go to that little corner, turn right, go up four steps, and you're faced with a wall with a plug in your, you know, electrical plug right here, and it has a little number four. <coughs> what we try to do is simply suggest that people, as they come down, flow one way, and as they go up, flow the other way. And there's basically one, two suspended surfaces, the other one which is w lit with bright daylight. Then on the fourth floor, you see kind of yet another variation of the same strategy here. Like in this, just as in the second floor, we have this floor to ceiling black uh, walls. Here, there's no need for, for acoustic or spatial division, but an uh, acoustic or kind of you know, division in terms of lighting, but simply a sense of division has to be created between the two sides of one of these uh, gallery boxes <coughs> that are interlinked. So what we created was what we call this kind of picket fence approach, a picket, white picket fence that runs uh, across all these galleries and connects them uh, in the direction of the openings. And, and the other direction kind of doesn't close the space, allows you to view the artwork on the other side. Uh, <coughs> a typical exhibition door. <laughs> It's a little video that shows how, I mean, what basically, what do you see when you look from one side of the space to the other side? And then finally, the climax of this project is in the fifth floor of Giasma, which is the most difficult floor to deal with. It basically was the space in which all the three-dimensional work, all the work that you can participate with, all, all the work that uh, requires you to kind of walk around, be able to examine them from different sides were located. And <coughs> here, basically, the exhibition architecture takes off. It kind of departs. It's no longer floor-to-ceiling structures, but it's <coughs> at the height of the back wall of the space. It kind of peels off and then the entire, there's two structures that both rise as the ceiling rises towards the end. In order to create, and what they do is they create, they keep the space open while they break it up on the ground level and they create, I mean, they basically make my point, I think, about the affiliation. They're different from the building. They kind of quite radically organize the space, <coughs> yet do they not, they do not in any way at least one doesn't experience that they would compete with the existing building. They operate at the same scale. The geometry is affiliated. The materials and the colors are more or less <coughs> experienced as the same. Funnily enough, we were also invited as artists in this exhibition. So there's the extra terrain. Now 
But I think, I mean, overall, that this <coughs> there were two, I mean, the remarkable thing about this exhibition was that whereas the intensities experiment, you can imagine, I mean, it was very provocative and it was, it, it's a research project. But this, this experiment, uh, it was very important to us and it, I think it's very important uh, precisely for the reason that I think Chris pointed out because it proves that you know what we're not what we're not what we're not dealing with here is formalism or formal expressionism basically it, it's it's something that you could presume you know you could, an argument that you could perhaps uh, make from some of the other try to make from some of the other project basically here uh, every single artist I, I didn't get come across at least any artist who was kind of negative about the architecture on the on the contrary and not not exaggerating many of the people came and said literally they said that they've never seen an exhibition where the architecture has a, such a strong role and it serves artwork so well this, so I think to prove that it, it, it is possible that in some level there's a very successful uh, relationship be reach between the different components of the exhibition uh, the architecture was in no way a compromise And it served, uh, but yet it served all the needs of the artwork that one could hope for. I think, how are we doing in terms of, it's eight o'clock. I think, uh, I think I've spoken enough, maybe I think it would be a good time for some questions. Chris? Thanks. Uh, um, do we have a microphone, Joel, or we just have to do it casually? Um, are there any questions from the uh, floor? <coughs> Something, uh, hmm? something nicely perverse about an uh, architect who claims to uh, want to slightly uh, provoke some discomfort in the uh, viewer, correcting Stephen Hall, who claims to be a phenomenologically uh, inspired architect, mm -hmm. uh, correcting his counterintuitive moves. <laughs> No, not him. <laughs> he's well, not Michael. He's not otherwise, allowed. you're going to have to listen to Michael talk for the next 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah OK. That provokes some response. Um, the last project, <coughs> excuse me, the last, the last project, uh, you talk about it, especially the last two, departing from your fascination and formalism, which is clearly present, regardless of what you say. But what intrigues me more is uh, getting from you guys a kind of exploration or an explanation um, of the kind of process that you went through with those various uh, artists that you were working jointly with, because you talk very little about that. I mean, how you actually engaged with those guys and how much they influenced and even changed the shapes of those walls or the heights of them. Did that enter into it, or did you uh, predetermine that with the hope that it was already so uh, beautifully integrated with the kind of work that they were going to produce? No, I mean, I think, is this on? Hello, yeah. Uh, <coughs> no, I think one, on, on a more general level, I think one of the qualities of the kind of, uh, and first of all, the formal language that's used in many of the projects, it's because it's open-ended and it's incomplete. So it doesn't really matter. We were, we agreed on an architectural approach and sort of strategic steps to take with the curators. Uh, we proposed an initial design and we spent most of the time studying the specific needs of the artwork and we met most of the artists. And we adapted the design time after time. The design, and the design only benefited from it. Because, you know, it consists partly the language is such that, uh, you know, it doesn't, it's not a kind of like, uh, it doesn't, it only benefits from the more restrictions that come into play that start to articulate it, the better the project becomes. So actually the formal language comes, uh, allows us to be very, very flexible. And this project was a result, and I think part of the success was that there was a very good team of curators that worked intensely with us and that we provided them the tool. I think one of the central, 
one of the things that I didn't go here, that one of the things that we've done in many of the projects, like the intensities or the arts project, is to develop tools, digital or physical models, that allow people from outside architecture to engage in the design process so that their input, you know, that they can input, basically. Because there is no way that you can design an exhibition of, of 70 or so artists successfully without allowed creating a mechanism that allows them to participate in the design. There's so much to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Next well, in time. fact, I mean, you could you could say that it's actually not very different at all from, say, the uh, time capsule hmm. by the New York Times. It's a very similar operation, isn't it? It's exactly. a strategy of affiliation towards the objects that may get installed exactly. into that object versus the artworks. It's actually a very similar strategy. It might result in two Precise, different, yeah. in what appears different, but one could make an argument that's a cohesive strategy. It's exactly. I mean, that's what the, somehow the maybe that's something that I should have stated. I mean, the, one of the characteristics is, this, is the open-endedness and incompleteness of form, the formal language, the form that's deployed, allows you to, for example, in the case of the New York Times, to actually design a capsule, and in that case, it doesn't, again, the idea was to design a series of nine capsules, the form of which would, a specific form would depend of the constraints that arise from the objects that are selected by the readers. All we did was to kind of select, you know, as it were, performance criteria, and uh, you know, kind of over-determined the, the language and just over-determined the design of the object. But within those constraints, the kind of the, the design benefits from all the unexpected uh, kind of forces that come into play. I think that's, just, and when I said we try to incorporate the unex, uh, unexpected, I think that's, you know, it's a very, you know, it's a very sincere attempt to do, <laughs> we have very sincerely attempted to do so. And I think that's why there are some sort of formal things that, that emerge, precisely because they allow us to do so. <laughs> Michael, you're not. A <laughs> Let me see the breakup of Ocean North right here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Nate. I was wondering how would the process change if, you, if it wasn't self-funded? You didn't have to go out to find the, the, the money and fund it yourself. How would it? Well, in ours was funded, clearly. Yeah. We were commissioned that design. Intensity is wasn't. Yes, of course. I mean, it's usually when it's funded, there's a, there's, a, there's a client that comes in with a very very strong input. For the intensities, it's the process is more, more and then it becomes more easily enter a collaboration. And you have to judge first whether the collaboration is successful. I think the only way to do good projects is to have a good client and a good collaboration. And that's what we did with, for example, artists. We first made sure that they want our approach. We agreed on that, and then everything was an evolution. It's more difficult when you do a project like Intensities, which is self-initiated, innovated. You create the whole infrastructure yourself, and you know so much is possible, of course. So I, you know, it's, that's a much more difficult project to construct. It's very easy when you're given a project, as it were. I mean, they're different, very different situation. No, I think <laughs> I always decide that not. the extra train was self-funded, uh, intensity was self-funded, chamber works was self-funded. All these installations were uh, self-funded. But as a result of that, it seems that that the art world is starting to adapt us. Uh, that in the art world, there's a great kind of ex there's an experimental tradition. I mean, the AA has a great experimental tradition. But for example, Finland in the architecture, there is there isn't really an experimental tradition. It's a more uh, our work, uh, you know, this kind of, exp it's very hard for people a lot of times to see how this kind of experimental work, installations and such, you know, fit into the kind of field of architecture, how they serve that. In, in, in most countries, I think this is the case. But I think as a result of that, we've been approached and invited by many art institutions these days to work, which is fine because they, uh, you know, they ident identify and they have funds to kind of uh, basically support some of our research. I have a feeling one of the immediate differences is you don't end up with a paintbrush in your hand that Pat and Nick last two days. Mm. <laughs> um, anything else? Uh, okay. A rebuttal.
What do you mean? Mapping the changes that happened to what process? Uh, yeah. I mean, the evolution of the design or the evolution of the project on the site? Uh, both. both. Well, yeah, I mean, of, we always, I mean, I could give the, another lecture which is about design process. I think we have well documented each design <laughs> process and we try to, <coughs> one, I think one thing that we've been successful at is to, through the kind of design language, we've, it's, again, the design process benefits from the fact that there's more than one people working on it. Uh, it benefits from the, the design process is highly evolutionary, rarely determining a specific form, determining kind of performance criteria and certain aims. But we don't, you know, pre try to predetermine pre a design. And what we haven't done very specifically is, is a kind of doc careful documentation of the performance of, for example, the intensities project, which would have been interesting through, you know, some means to videotape and notate and study. Uh, I think that's something that we can work on, but that's another, that's where you, so far the resources have always ended right there. That's the future. I have a question. Uh, on the sort of planning for the unpredictable, or the uh, ability for the architecture to um, adapt slightly in some way it's in a, uh, over the unpredictable future of a building. Um, it struck me that in many ways it's sort of a, it's a strategy about sort of architecture's anxiety on the one hand to be sort of timeless, mm -hmm. you know, in this sensibility. And on the other hand, of, of course, it's immediate obsolescence as soon as it's built. Um, and it seems modern architecture especially sort of uh, dances around this anxiety around both. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could uh, maybe expand on your attitude towards sort of the time of the architecture. I mean, a lot of its temporary structures, exhibition architectures, was, it evokes sort of a literal sense of time, but, you know, there's also recurrent throughout the projects, a sort of, uh, I want to call it a meditation, but an engagement with how long, right, this thing lasts. I mean, from the time capsule to the stadium to the, uh, to the exhibition, exhibition architecture. I mean, could you talk about that, about its sort of obsolescence, its contemporariness? Mm. Maybe expand. <coughs> yes, I think, I mean, first of all, I think we probably consider every project temporary. It's just the, the span varies greatly from projects that are very there for a few weeks to projects that are projected to be there for 50 to 100 years or how, many, how long a building is projected to stand. And, uh, yeah, I mean, different considerations enter uh, enter into uh, play, but I think, uh, I mean, for example, what seems to, what I expect that would happen in, uh, with a project such as the Turler Stadium and the intensities, is that uh, so certain kind of, that the project eventually does become coded and appropriated in certain ways, that people do, f do you know, Know, it becomes, you know, perhaps even a new typology. Um, and I wonder what, I mean, in, I think that's inevi inevitable. I mean, the, already the intensities project was there long enough that it, you know, people then collectively, depending on uh, the definition of the object starts to take place, I mean, it starts, starts to form. You know, I think the definition <coughs> of, the, of an, any architectural object is a dynamic one, no matter how it's designed, you know. As, as the context changes, as the world changes, the way it's viewed changes, and the way it's appropriated will change. Uh, and I think that's not no different for our projects. Uh, I think the, the difference lies in that we don't, that we that try to take that into account already in designing, and really, uh, in the first instance, give space for, you know, provide, uh, the possibility for, for that kind of appropriation by the end users of the communities that <coughs> allow them to take and kind of allow those kind of meanings, uh, I don't know, meanings or codings to emerge instead of I even attempting to prescribe them. But it's a difficult question. <laughs> so. 
Thank you. Well, sorry. Pascal. Anything else? Michael? Pascal? Depend, it depends a lot. Uh, I mean, uh, I think our approach depends on the, depends a bit on the project. But on a on a more general note, I think every in every project we quite carefully consider uh, you know what the kind of you know what the fun anticipated functional requirements are, what one can predict, and what needs to be provided. You know what how to appropriate for them. For example, in the exit terrain. But then, in, in, the, in the project, we also recognize that, you know, recognizing, I mean, this is how I say it, recognizing that that, uh, that function uh, and then program also emerges as a possibility of form, in many cases, we've simply, I think, it's been really simple, simply decided that, you know, that it's, uh, in the intensities was extreme. It simply decided to, uh, with a kind of use of minimal kind of architectural components, provide for a kind of maximum amount of different kinds of configurations with the hypothesis that that will then kind of enable or provide for affordances for you know 
for different kinds of views to take place without ever uh, attempting to predict them. So it's a kind of two, you know, it's a kind of two-way approach. Of course, we consider the specific brief or, or the kind of the dance that you're supposed to dance there, but also in many of the projects, recognize we've, we've experimented with the idea in, in the extreme, most extreme case, with the intensities or the exit with the fact that we also, um, you know, cannot predict the way the object will, will be used, and we should, you know, allow for the function and or the kind of the performance to emerge real time, and you know. In the projects like Kiasma, you have a kind of higher degree of control, and and uh, but in these kind of more experimental projects, in some cases it's kind of appropriate. The, the 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 bridge structure, for example, for the intensities, I mean, it had this ludicrous kind of part to it, in just there, so that you couldn't tell it wouldn't. There was no way that you would read it as a functional object, and it would suggest something else. But <coughs> and the strategy there is to just to adapt it. We've, what we've tried to do usually is to take the minimum components and change their interrelationships constantly, vary them through space in such a way that these components kind of provide together you know, a great variety of different kinds of spaces and experiences and spatial affordances. A kind of maximum effects through minimal means, a kind of twisted sort of minimalism as I see it. Does that answer it at all? Yeah, I think your stretch is like already very far. Yeah. <laughs> you just mentioned, mm. you know, just, I mean, all the parts I did in Berlin, I couldn't do it because you, you, you need the railing so that people don't fall down and all this. Oh, the bridge was completely approved in, as a public so bridge. <laughs> but this was a public, it was a approved, a public bridge. The, bri the railings were just so high that you walked inside this kind of corridor of graphics. <coughs> Pascal wants us to... <laughs> What? Pascal wants a synthetic uh, life world. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know it's very physical. <laughs> I guess according to that uh, mid-level manager from the technical university, I have this fantasy he speaks with a Texan accent, but I know that's not true. He probably just would say it's whether he feels feminine or masculine that day, I guess. Um, if there aren't any other questions, I think we'll draw it to a close. Uh, I'm sure we'll be getting a beer afterwards. Oh. Somebody. There's a late, there's a last yeah, minute. Just one more thing. I just have a question, maybe a comment that you could sort of respond to. Does your work have to do with this idea of a liberating effect that you don't describe how it things get used and you pose something that people can interact with in a way they, they feel, they, they, they like to? In another sense, there might be someone who argues that a chair is created by a certain type because it therefore falls to the background and gives you a certain freedom to do other things. I guess play is the key word, actually. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yes. I mean, it's a, that's the kind of relationship we hope that people engage in with our projects. I think play is the best word. But I mean, you're what we're not proposing. What I see is a kind of a new architecture that replaces all architecture, and like everything is going to be wobbly and all over the place. <laughs> no, no. I mean, of course, this is when a different time span when it comes to the question when when it's a, you know an exhibition with very specific needs. You can. We've, I think we've shown that you can. You know, then. Uh, you know. Uh, kind of make a combination, or, you know, adjust our strategy. I don't think. I think conventional furniture will always exist. And fine. Uh, I think what we're researching is a kind of, uh, an addition, an elaboration, a kind of existing set of architectural responses and strategies. But then secondly, for example, in the exit terrain, it doesn't take too long to figure out how to sit there and read it. And once you've done it once, you would always know it. And then that kind of, for you, because who you are, I mean, a certain, you would find your own little space in it, and you would always kind of, more or less, probably you know, spend your time reading in that particular position after the little exploration. 
but it's still, as a user, it gives you a different role. It's different experience. It's very different from you going to a shop, seeing a piece of furniture, and you, it, the furniture tells you how you're supposed to sit. It's designed to a 175 centimeter tall man who sits like, you know, this. And, and uh, so it does, you know, it's that simple. It provides for another kind of freedom. But I think both object kind of categories have their use. Discover the cyborg within. Okay, well with that, we'll draw it to a close. Thanks very much. Thank you.